Good afternoon and welcome along to this session um, on our latest Fraser of Island, our economic commentary. I can see that the numbers coming in are still going up, but we'll, we'll make a start just now um, and uh, allow you to think about any questions you might want to ask us about our latest publication. Just to say um, that um, I'll be doing uh, going through a few of the key points that we published today in our economic commentary, um, and then you'll have a chance to ask us some questions if you wish. Um, my name is Mary Spowage, I'm the director of the Fraser of Allender Institute, and I'll be joined by my colleagues, um, David Iser and Emma Congreve, and also our special guest, um, Angela Mitchell from, from Deloitte. So, just remember, please, that if you want to ask us any questions, either because you've had a look this morning and you've got some questions you want to ask us about the sections of the commentary um, or um, that occur to you while um, I'm talking through the main points that we published today, then please um, type them into the Q&A box um, and we'll do our best to, to address them and answer them during this session. But please don't be shy um, get those questions in while I'm talking um, and then we'll go have a plenty of time after I've spoken to try and address your questions. So before we move to the q and I'll just go through the main points from the commentary that we published today. I suppose we need to take a step back and think about where the Scottish economy is now. Um, this, this data was actually published yesterday, the latest data for Scotland, the April data, so it's not in the commentary, um, but we've updated our charts this morning to um, be able to show the latest data. And what we can see is that the Scottish economy remains 3.7% below the, the pre-pandemic level of output. And this is the same figure for the UK in April. So the experience in aggregate of the Scottish and UK economies seems to be fairly similar so far. The good news is that it's above the, what we call the post-pandemic peak. So this is the level that the economy reached in October 2020 before restrictions were reimposed in the autumn and going into the beginning of 2021. But as ever with this pandemic and the ensuing economic crisis, there continues to be stark sexual differences. We know that, um, that some sectors such as manufacturing and construction after a fairly large hit in the, the first lockdown managed to adapt to new and different ways of working and weren't as severely impacted by the subsequent lockdowns we saw in the autumn and then into the winter. However, it's, it's the social spending sectors, those related to tourism, like poor old accommodation and food services, where we saw them the biggest hit during the first lockdown and um, also the largest hit during the autumn and into the post Christmas period. We can see that there's a bit of a recovery there in accommodation and food services in April, but it's still only just over half of pre-pandemic levels of output that, um, that that sector is actually generating. So a long way to go before that sector is back to more normal times. We analyze in the commentary a number of different indicators to try and assess where the economy is in a more up-to-date fashion than we can get from uh, you know, the more official statistics. So there are a number of indicators produced by the ONS through the, the, the Business Insights and Conditions Survey that are analyzed by the Scottish government. And there's lots of helpful material published which helps us to track in a more up-to-date basis how the economy is doing, how many businesses are trading, how many businesses have staff on furlough and so on. And there's other more novel data sources that people have been monitoring in order to understand what's happening in the economy such as the number of vacancies that we're seeing in different parts of the country to understand whether the economy is starting to recover and get back to more normal times, um, such as advertising jobs. But what we can see is that despite some pauses in the roadmap during May, in terms of um, you know, local authorities moving from level two to level one, that didn't happen on mass as was expected in mid-May. But despite that, we see lots of these indicators in very positive territory. So, Essentially, we can't forget how far we've come since the end of April um, when things have started to open up in Scotland. There's still significantly more activity in the economy now than there was then. And this is reflected in what we're seeing in all of the data and is likely to be reflected in the growth figures when they're published for me in June. So despite the fact there's been some pauses in our emergence from lockdown, we're still um, you know, well far ahead of where we were in April in terms of the openness in the economy. 
A feature of the data recently has been that consumers seem ready to spend the money that they've saved during the period of the pandemic. What we have is record high levels of consumer savings. So this data goes up to the end of the year. We don't get updated figures on this for, for Q1 until the end of this month. But we've seen that there's a, there's a record level of savings in households throughout the period of the pandemic. Recent data that we've got on credit card spending shows that consumers have started to spend as restrictions ease. And there's also um, significant increases in mobility, in mobility data to hospitality venues and the major population centres. So it certainly seems like consumers are ready and willing to spend this money that they've saved during the period of the pandemic. <clears throat> so, given that, we have um, revised up our expectations for growth. Um, now, the eagle-eyed amongst you will, will spot that um, a lot of the growth has been moved from 2022 into 2021. And this has been reflected on a number of other forecasters, essentially given the, the really fast nature and positive nature of the vaccine rollout, which has led people to rise up um, and led us to revise up our expectations for growth in 2021. But overall, it does mean that we think that we'll reach the pre-pandemic peak earlier than our previous forecasts in March, and we might be looking at July 2022, when we're going to reach that peak. It must be remembered, though, this is still over two years after the pandemic started. We are more cautious, however, than organisations like the Bank of England. We think we'll be back at that sort of level by the end of this year. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are some other topics that we're covering in the commentary. This time, we, re we released research recently where we looked at how areas had been identified in need through the UK government's levelling up programme, which seeks to distribute capital funding across local authorities in the UK in order to focus on regeneration, transport con connectivity and economic need. What we did in the, um, the, the section in the commentary was to take that a little bit further and think how the priority areas in need um, are, are, are related to how different areas may have experienced the pandemic. We're hoping to do more work on this in, 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 in the weeks to come, um, but we just thought this was an interesting juxtaposition, particularly given that it's, it's rural areas who have much more of their economy dependent on tourism that seem to have, um, have suffered the most during the pandemic. <clears throat> we also have a section on trade. <coughs> what we see is that goods trade has recovered to pre-pandemic levels, although there was a volatile period as the UK exited the, the EU transition period at the end of December. However, what we see is services trade remains depressed due to lower demand caused by the restrictions that we have in the economy. We also do some analysis of data on um, business trade with Northern Ireland. And um, there's definite evidence that trade between GB and Northern Ireland has been disrupted with around a quarter of businesses who trade with Northern Ireland reporting uh, decreased volumes of trade. We also continue our series analysis on, on home working. What we see in our survey is that it's still around a quarter of businesses who are expecting to reduce their office footprint as they move back to more normal times. <coughs> that has remained fairly stable. And of those businesses who are looking to reduce their office footprint, the, the main considerations are around connectivity, internet connectivity, and cost, and less important seems to be um, proximity to city centres, which is an interesting finding given um, the considerations around the future for town and city centres that we're all thinking about as perhaps we start to return to work at least part of the week. So since we last released our commentary, obviously there's been the Scottish election and we have our new government in place now. <coughs> So key challenges for the new government are obviously around COVID recovery. Um, so not just the NHS and obviously education catch up, 
for young people who have, have lost so much time in school, but also business engagement and support. And that becomes very important, obviously, for those sectors who are still operating under significant restrictions, and perhaps who are operating under more restrictions <clears throat> than they were expecting, given the roadmap. Also, there's issues around transition to net zero that featured heavily in the election campaign. And there's a lot of particular issues when we consider the links to levelling up with things like Northeast transition and the impact, and particularly in Northeast throughout the pandemic. There are obviously some very challenging targets as well <clears throat> to be achieved over the course of this parliament on climate change and child poverty. And of course, constitutional issues are never far away and are likely to feature throughout the course of this parliament. <coughs> Sorry. So that gives you a, a, a whistle stop tour of the main areas that we've covered in our, our commentary. And I can see that the questions are starting to come in. Please don't be shy and um, type in your questions in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to, to answer those. So joining me for um, the question session uh, is, is my colleagues um, David Iser and Emma Congreve and also Angela Mitchell from Deloitte who's the head of public sector for Scotland at, at Deloitte. <coughs> so welcome colleagues and thanks for joining me today and sorry about the frog in my throat. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, yeah, so some of the questions coming in already um, are, are around the sort of levelling up agenda. So, um, and that, that's obviously been a huge source of interest in, in recent months. So, um, if I could come to you first, Emma, if that's all right. Um, there's a question here about um, the fact that levelling up and, and our analysis of it is focused more on regional inequality and less on the difference between different people and households. What do we know so far about the impacts on different people and households throughout the period of the pandemic? Yeah, so, I mean, often there is um, a correlation between uh, places and people in terms of, uh, of sort of economic and financial issues, but that's not always the case. And obviously COVID has made um, you know, has mixed things up quite a lot in terms of some of those impacts. So, um, so I'll just say a little bit about what we know about um, sort of people that have been affected. Um, it's it's all it's actually um, still too early to tell for sure because a lot of the statistics um, we'd rely upon for for that kind of thing have come from the labour market statistics, which have been um, sort of heavily kind of influenced by furlough. So we don't really have the full. Um, insight into what's happened in, in, in the labour market um, and also statistics on things like household income which, which have got a significant lags so they're not yet available even for the start of the pandemic. Um, but it, it obviously has not been the same for everyone and um, there has been a lot of, of um, sort of economic harm but there's also been you know big parts of, of society that have not really faced um, sort of adverse financial circumstances and I think it's quite interesting to note that actually on aggregate consumption spend has fallen more than income so there is a big group of people um, this is across the UK who are you know who have, have been able to save more and that's very much because people haven't been going out and spending money in these kind of social uh, social parts of the economy but that in turn um, has implications for the people that usually work in those sectors, which tend to be people that are lower paid and younger. Um, so they will be those who've already faced the most um, economic harm through this period due to the, just those sectoral um, implications as you showed in, showed in your chart earlier. There might be a big bounce back there as, as things are opening up more, but, um, and obviously there is um, evidence of there being quite a lot of vacancies in those sectors and actually um, firms looking for more people. So it's definitely an interesting area now to see what happens um, in the next few months. And um, the other group which, um, which we think has been um, affected has been uh, sort of people who've had additional barriers because of, of COVID, so be that parents or people with um, ill health or you know, existing pre-existing Ill illnesses. And they've been kind of had those additional issues to deal with be it kind of um, the concern and the worry um, of COVID and, and the need to shield. Um, and that also um, is the case for carers of those, those people too. And then parents who've had to deal with, um, you know, schools um, closing for that period of time. And now this kind of um, 
uncertainty with children being sent home and um, a short notice and, and all those things going on, although school holidays and um, just about to start, that will calm down. But yeah, as I say, there's definitely, um, we know that, that there'd be very different impacts in very different parts of the population. And the full picture of that, I suppose, isn't quite, um, quite been unveiled just yet. Yeah, and, and there are so many interesting questions coming up, but we're just going to stay on leveling up for a second. Um, uh, Angela, I wanted to come to you next. I mean, obviously, we've done a lot of analysis recently on, on how you identify the areas in need, um, you know, the sorts of data you can use to, to help, you know, identify the areas who might be in most need of, of investment in transport connectivity or um, regeneration. Um, but what are your thoughts on the kind of priorities around leveling up? Well, I think firstly, I'd say that the UK government wants to demonstrate their responsiveness to residents and stakeholders views about local priorities um, and instill greater levels of local pride, probably just as much as they want to tackle deeper underlying problems of economic underperformance. Um, they definitely want to show quick delivery. It's clear they want projects wherever possible uh, to be fully up and running by the end of this parliament. Um, and they want to promote active involvement of residents and local MPs as well in that selection and appraisal process. So um, while the process might not be as transparent and clear cut as uh, you as economists would like, I completely understand that. Um, I do think that they are reasonable requirements. Um, secondly, though, I would say that levelling up is currently a catchy slogan and a collection of different policies. It, rather than a clear-cut strategy with a, a credible programme that's underpinning it. So we all know that you know, economic underperformance is due to many different things like poor population health, um, uneven education skills offer, um, lack of good transport, um, lack of diversity and, and job opportunities. So a, a full programme to, to grapple all of those things really requires an integrated multifaceted approach across government. Um, and that's why Neil O'Brien has been appointed recently um, and is charged with responsibility for a white paper, which is coming in the autumn. And if, if that's to be, if that's to be um, you know, giving a considered view on, on levelling up, then it does need to cover a number of different things. So it needs to, to demonstrate how it's going to deliver that integrated programme. Um, it needs to see how success is going to be measured, which uh, will therefore respond to some of the data challenges that you rose in uh, you wrote about in your commentary. Um, and it also needs to make sure it's not played out as a north-south issue. So it's much more granular than that, as, as you've picked out in your commentary as well. Um, problems of economic mm -hmm. underperformance and need, uh, you know, at the start we're painted as a bit of the north-south divide. Um, but it's not just an issue with the north of England and Scotland, but London and South East have some of the most deprived neighbourhoods of the whole of the UK. Um, and in fact, if you take out um, accommodation costs, then 28% uh, I think of Londoners uh, are living in poverty. And then finally, I'd say that uh, inclusive growth, and I use that term intentionally rather than levelling up, um, it should transcend party politics um, and be a key priority for government for the next decade, regardless of who's in power at the, the national or the local levels. Now, you might say that's a naive view, uh, but it is uh, something that isn't going to be solved in a, you know, a single election cycle. And I think that Scotland should absolutely try and capitalise on the current policies as much as possible, um, rather than getting drawn into any kind of political gaming or worrying that the money's going directly from the UK government to local. <laughs> Um, that's, that's, that's a, yeah, that's an optimistic view. Um, but just just briefly, um, just to finish off on leveling up, um, what's the kind of do? What do you see as the private you, you, private sector role in this? Because you mentioned government, but what's the role of the private sector? Yeah, it, it, and the private sector has a big role to play. I think obviously the collaboration between national and local government is important, but the, the business needs to to engage in it as well. Um, I mean, apart from it just being the right thing to do, um, businesses have to demonstrate a positive impact on society because it's so important for the, the younger generation of talent that's coming through. Um, I'm leading on our contribution to levelling up um, across the, our, our firm, and I can see there's a real passion for people to play a role in their local economies um, and making that difference. And that's, you know, that applies to as much to Scotland as it does to our regions in England. 
Um, if, you, if you look at some areas like energy transition, um, that's one area where it's, it's so crucial for the private sector to play a part, not just the big energy firms around Aberdeen, but the whole ecosystem around it. If you consider the tech industries like fintech, medtech, space tech, I mean, while we've got a head start in Scotland with Fintech Scotland, there's you know, massive growth opportunities in that which, which require the, the private sector to, to, to get involved. And then skills is a huge area, a really consistent message that um, there's a need to make skills more relevant. Um, and I, it's really important that um, employers get into the middle of that picture and are saying, here are the skills that we need for the future. Um, as opposed to our, our HE um, and FE institutions um, focusing on, on where the, the, the budget's coming from. So we need to put employers right at the centre of that and build out much more um, tailored programmes for that local area to, so that that local skills um, pipeline. Yeah. That's a really interesting point, actually, and it links to um, another question we've had on... Well, it, it links pretty well to a question we've had from Helen, um, on, um, on on unemployment and, and employment. Um, so um, Helen's asking, um, David, I'm going to come to you for this one, just to warn you. <laughs> um, Helen's asking, do you have a sense of potential projections about um, employment or unemployment post-COVID, especially on, on youth unemployment? Um, well, projections on unemployment um, uh, are pretty challenging uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that there's, there is still quite a bit of uncertainty around where we currently are on unemployment and, and, and employment, um, as Emma touched on. Um, so we know what the data is telling us, the labour market data, and the labour market data is generally telling a fairly positive story um, in the sense that unemployment hasn't got to the sorts of levels that many people thought it would have done. But there's a bit of a mismatch in that some of the HMRC data is, seems to be pointing to potentially a bit more of a decline in, it, in employment. Um, but the other big reason why it's kind of hard to make uh, projections is because it's very, very difficult to project what's going to happen even later this summer, later this year, as the restrictions are um, removed but also the furlough scheme is simultaneously withdrawn. And when that happens, what we'll undoubtedly see is that there are, that some of the structural changes that we've seen during the pandemic will um, sort of be revealed to, to, be, to be permanent. So um, you know, people will tend to work from home more of the time. They will do more online shopping more of the time. And those things will have uh, impacts on the number and distribution of jobs. So that's one uncertainty, it's quite, it's quite how significant those permanent changes will be. But then the other uncertainty related to that is how uh, able the labour market is to adapt to that new normal. So how, how rapidly will the labour market be able to reallocate to those new, um, th that, that new distribution of jobs? And there's a, there's a positive, an optimistic um, uh, uh, perspective on that, which I've heard expressed, uh, I think it was Andrew Bailey, actually, the, ba the Bank of England governor, who, whose, whose view is that in terms of that labour market reallocation, there's a, there's a more optimistic story there than there was in the 80s and 90s, because what's going on here is some reallocation within the service sector, where job skills and tasks are relatively transferable. Uh, unlike in the 80s and 90s, where it was a sort of massive structural transformation from from industry to to the service sector, so that's the kind of um, the optimistic outlook. But undoubtedly, this issue of structural change and how able the labour market is to to reallocate, uh, there is uncertainty around. But I think one thing we can say is that certain sectors, um, the, the sectors that are still uh, most affected by restrictions, hospitality and retail and so on, and, but consequently uh, the people who work in those sectors, including the young people, are, are, are going to face the, uh, the biggest risks here. And, and it's among the young that unemployment has already increased most during the pandemic from about 8% to about 13%. So that's clearly where a big part of the risks lie. 
and so policy is going to have to be mindful of that and 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 adapt very quickly later on in in the year in terms of um initiatives around uh, skilling reskilling and job matching and so on uh, as the scale of those issues becomes clearer but it's very it's very difficult at the moment to predict the start of this year most most uh, forecasters were thinking that unemployment was going to get to about eight percent this summer and now they're kind of thinking more like five percent so it's it's changing really rapidly yeah and i know it's interesting how we've got this this dichotomy of maybe the macro picture looking a bit more positive but the the disparities between different groups or maybe different sectors are, are more stark than ever um, so it might look better in the, the sort of aggregate, but there are particular groups will be, you know, particularly badly hit. Um, and it just sort of related to that, we've got a question from Evelyn, Emma, um, and it's kind of related to what, what David was talking about, that education maybe going forward, um, you know, will, will online learning become part of, of a permanent norm for school children? It's perhaps a combined approach for office and homeworking. And, and I, I guess I was interested in your thoughts on, on the potential distributional um, implications of that if, if that was to be the case and I've seen quite a lot of commentary recently given so many children are out of school about the impacts that that's going to have and is this a sustainable position to you know continue to sort of send whole classes home and things like that when there are outbreaks at schools yeah um I'm not a parent myself but I have seen it in, in others <laughs> the kind of the chaos that ensues when um when that happens so um I think it's quite hard to, to think about that being sustainable um and the implications that has I, I and unfortunately it's still particularly for mothers um who tend to be the first one that's called by the school and is, is assumed still to be the one with the primary care responsibility um and yeah just in terms of I did mention it earlier but in thinking about um sort of um, things like the gender pay gap and, and working parents and um, if if there is that kind of um, continued sort of disruption to, to to parents in the workplace that could have you know long lasting impacts in terms of things like promotion and um, and all those kind of um, issues that are tied up with with the gender pay gap from what we know that if women are working part-time or more flexibly, often they're sort of penalized for that in terms of their progression in the workplace. So it's it's definitely the, the interaction between school and work is one that is going to need to be um, looked, at, looked at very closely, both for the parents and, and of course for the children. Um, so what, what is the best, um, best route forward for children? And I, I mean, I think it's very clear that the Scottish government thinks the permanent norm should be children in school back back to the way they were before. Um, but if we continue to have new variants um, and new outbreaks, um, there might be, yeah, there might need to be some uh, return to thinking about a more hybrid situation so that when kids have to go home, can't be in the school environment, there is a, a solution there for them at home. So again, it's, it's something that I think the government's gonna have to think on their feet about, but, um, and but the implications for children at home, um, whether or not their parents are around, I think as, as a big as a big um, issue for them in terms of their ability and kind of willingness to sit and learn. Um, and I think we've done some a bit of research in the north of Scotland, and you you do get some maybe quite surprising um, results. And whilst there definitely is a, um, evidence that lower income families struggle more because you know they they. In, in quite a lot of cases, they are required to, to be out the door um, working and they're not able to work from home. So they haven't got that same flexibility. But at the same time, you know, parents that have been on furlough um, have been affected financially, but actually have had more time at home and maybe being able to give um, their kids a bit more support than, than would have been the case. So it's not necessarily that kind of straightforward linear story in terms of understanding which kids will be most affected by home learning. Um, and because the situation as a parents has been so in flux over the last last while. But I think as, yeah, as it seems now that, that kind of workplaces and working hours with the end of furlough, that will start to come, go back to normal a bit more. I think we, we would have to be really concerned of, of situations where children um, have to be at home and parents aren't able to, to be there to support them. Um, or if they are, then the implications that has for the parent in the workplace. 
Um, so yeah, and, and these could have ramifications for many years. Yeah, <clears throat> and you can see some of the panelists who do have children nodding quite a lot to what you're seeing there. Um, Please keep them in school. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So we've talked a lot about um, the, I suppose, the wider implications of the changes in the labour market and the way we're, we're working. Um, and given we've got Angela here, I hope it's okay, Angela, but, but you, you know, you're a large employer, um, you know, we're office-based and during the pandemic, I imagine mostly we're, we're home-based. So um, I think you've made some announcements recently, but but how how are a big employer like Deloitte going to approach you know in terms of you know uh, asking people to come back to work or or allowing them to work flexibly? How are you approaching it as a big employer? Yeah, so it's it's something that's been top of mind as you can imagine because we have all entirely been working from home for the last sixteen months, apart from um, those clients that needed us on site. Um, and, you know, the pandemic has obviously demonstrated that we don't have to be physically together to, to work together. Um, but, you know, I think the majority of us are missing that the office environment is a collective space to come together and collaborate and, and socialise. Some missing it more than others, obviously. Um, and while every business is different, um, I think there's like to be a bit of a generational divide between colleagues as well. Um, our research found that twice as many under 35s want permanent flexible working compared to over 55s. And Deloitte, we have you know, more of a balance of, of younger people. Um, anecdotally, I absolutely see that in my conversations with chief execs in different organisations. There's you know, a bit of an old school mindset of, I want to be able to see my people to know that they are working. Um, but I think the reality of it is a productive person in the office is going to be a productive person at home and, and vice versa. Um, so yes, we have just announced uh, on Friday our new hybrid approach um, at Deloitte, giving our people the choice and the flexibility of, of when, where and, and how they work. Now, we've encouraged a flexible approach to, to working for, for many years, so you might say, well, that's, that's no big change really, um, but only half our people took up flexible working pre-COVID, so whether that was because um, they lacked awareness of what they could do or permission or autonomy to choose or just felt they might be missing out. Um, and our norm was to work on site with our clients on a daily basis. If you weren't on the client site, you were, you were in the office. So me personally, um, although I've for years worked at least one day a week from home and, and quite enjoyed that one day a week from home, um, I was still in London most weeks for a couple of days. Um, so I do not miss that, that red eye, but I do miss seeing people in person. Um, so right across the UK, across all organisations, as, as you say, um, While well, some have struggled with home working, the majority have, um, when the schools went back, enjoyed the, a slightly better quality of life without having a commute. So finding the way to adopt those better working practices, getting the, the best bits out of the last year, but, but still taking the upside of working in the office is, is what we're all striving for. And, and the overriding pr principle of, of our new policy is that we'll trust our people to decide where they can deliver their best work and um, when. Um, so that it's a uh, so we're not saying you have to be in the office for a set number of days at all you just work it out with your team leader and your client to determine what works for you now that has implications in terms of the estate's footprint and um, for the office layout because we we'll want much more collaborative spaces in the office and um, rather than people just working solely at desks um, we'll need to reinvent learning because we want um, development to still be a priority for us and there are also tax considerations as well. Um, but it does have you know, a lot of positives of the approach in terms of giving people the autonomy and hopefully better work-life balance, which will um, mean that they are more productive, enhanced well-being, and happier employers stay for longer as well. Mm -hmm. um, it should make us a more attractive employer and, and potentially allow us to tap into talent pools that you know would have looked at Deloitte before us. As, um, not for them because of extensive travel or rigid working hours. Um, and of course, there are significant environmental advantages from, from reducing that, that travel as well. On the downside, we have to be really careful of that always on culture. Um, I, for one, have certainly struggled with that over the last year. Um, although I'm hoping that's been as much a feature of lockdown, the fact that there's nothing else better to do, but we will, we will see when we start to emerge. Um, but also the need to invest in, in better technology because you know, while it works well, while we're all virtual, while we're all in the office, getting that mixed economy right so that it doesn't matter where, whether you're at home or, or in the office is something that's going to be key to 
to um, get it right. So I'm sure there'll be teething problems along the way, but um, for us, that, that's what we've determined is that is the best approach. Yeah, it's really interesting and there'll be lots of challenges for employers, as you say, as, as, as there are some people in the office and some people at home and how to, um, you know, not disadvantage people who don't happen to be around the table um, and making sure they have technology to allow that to happen. Um, you can see see those challenges and, um, you know, our, our um, the surveys that we've done for of businesses have, have um, been mixed in terms of the, the advantages and disadvantages. A lot of them have said that they feel that, yeah, of course, um, in collaboration and innovation has been difficult. Um, but you know, it has um, you know encouraged them to innovate um, in terms of technology, and 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 all of these sorts of things. Um, but obviously, sort of enforced everyone at home <laughs> is is different to you know allowing employees to choose the way they wish to work or or, or working it more flexibly around their their home life. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how those figures kind of change as people return to work, kind of maybe more and um, you know in terms of how how much they want to work. So. So thanks for that, Angela. Really interesting to see what Deloitte are doing uh, in this space and, and, uh, and other big employers are, are making announcements as well. Um, so all, a few different approaches there. Yeah. Um, if it is interesting, you're sort of just letting employees see what's right for them. Um, a little bit of a change of pace in terms of questions now. Um, we have done a big in, um, analysis, as I said, on, on trade um, and looking at the different impacts that have happened because of the pandemic and 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 since the we, we exceeded the eu transition period um at the end of december so david i'm going to come to you for this one uh, <laughs> um how much do we know about the split um in terms of the impact on trade between the pandemic and what's been caused by brexit so has the pandemic masked a lot of the the impacts that we might have expected to see from the the end of the EU transition period, or do we just don't not know because it's you know the data's sort of we just we just just can't tell what's been caused by what. Um, that's a good question. I think I think actually on the trade specific elements of that, uh, Mary, I'm sure you could give a better answer than than me. Um, I mean, I. Uh, I saw the, the question in, 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 it interpreted a, a bit more uh, in terms of general economic um, impacts rather than well, rather than trade specific impacts. Yeah, that's but, fair. That's fair. Um, <laughs> and, and I think so. so I mean, it, on one level, um, on a sectoral level, um, the pandemic and Brexit um, have had quite different uh, impacts. And, and I think. Um, Mary, that the previous commentary, or maybe the previous, yeah, the one in December, we had a kind of, um, yeah, we kind of compared um, the impacts of COVID and Brexit, and it tended to be those areas that were, yeah, um, least impacted by Brexit that were most impacted by COVID and vice versa. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, I mean, clearly, it's very much the sectors where um, service-based sectors where human contact is important that have been most affected by uh, pandemic pandemic related restrictions uh, whereas in the first part of this year um, uh, Brexit was causing issues for well for many manufacturing uh, ex exporting uh, businesses and I think for some of those businesses those those impacts of Brexit were probably going to turn out to be sort of teething issues around paperwork and so on but for some of them uh, particularly in, in agriculture and uh, fisheries and meat production and so on, some of those impacts of, of the new trade regime are going to be are going to be permanent. And while while those sectors are, I guess, a small part of the uh, Scottish economy overall, they're they're clearly a big deal for certain parts of the country geographically in certain um communities so 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 the pandemic and and brexit in a way have quite different sectoral effects um but two things may be also worth saying one is that um i think the combination of brexit and the pandemic are already creating skill shortages in certain sectors uh, like agriculture and like in social care and it's very difficult to know well how much of the issue there is because um, of the pandemic and, uh, and and how much of it is due to uh, Brexit and therefore workers from uh, parts of the EU deciding to return 
Um, the other thing is that although um, over the last year, clearly the big economic impact has come through the pandemic, um, increasingly forecasters are thinking that, you know, this is this is a sort of temporary thing over over a couple of years, perhaps with some with some permanent impact. But but actually, the long run impact of Brexit um, will be ultimately much more significant, although less visible, because uh, there's still the expectation that, that Brexit will will have a long run effect on on reducing productivity and economic output as a result of these uh, trade fr trade frictions that uh, persist um, indefinitely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, as you say, the impacts on the labour market um, and, and how um, temporary or otherwise they are, um, we're not really going to know until things um, are, are a bit more back to normal. Um, and, and we see the impact that as we move into next year, I would have thought in terms of um, a supply for the labour market in particular sectors. Um, Emma, if I could, could come to you, 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 you talked a bit about um, some households being able to save and, you know, the savings ratio being at an all time high at the end of the year, a, a number of households have been able to save um, both through um, restrictions, meaning they can't spend money in their normal way, um, but also saving money perhaps by, by working at home and not spending um, money on, on commuting and so on. Um, do we have, um, we've obviously talked about that the, there's signs that consumers are spending credit card data, mobility data, suggesting that that, that pent up demand is being released. But do we have, have an, do you have any other insights into sort of how long we expect that to go on for and how long that's going to provide a boost for the economy? When might, might consumers get a bit more cautious, do you think? There are a few things that um, that could shift the balance in different ways. Um, so obviously with the type of spending that's, that's really been affected, that social spending, um, it's not going to necessarily be um, sort of pent up in the sense that because, you know, if you used to go out for dinner once a week and you've not been able to do that for a year, you wouldn't, you wouldn't kind of put, you know, spend the next year going out five times as much for dinner because you've missed <laughs> you've missed it so much um, so so in that sense we're not going to kind of you know recoup all of that spending in the, in the same places that they, it would have occurred had um, the pandemic not happened but if people have more disposable income and, and this is just some people have more disposable income they may um yeah, the, 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 the likelihood is that they will spend at least yeah, some of that um, ex, extra money in in the places that in in that kind of social sector as, as things go forward um, but yeah in terms of where the limit is on that and how much yeah, catch up you'll get in terms of recouping lost spending there um is yeah that's that's really hard to know um and i think you know things are still quite uncertain in the economy we're much more optimistic most recent um commentary talks to that but you know we don't actually know um what what the next few months six months year hold in terms of this pandemic and um and and so there will still be a lot of cautious um, people out there who you know aren't completely convinced that their job is fully secure if everything shuts down again for another six months um you know some some businesses are getting very i'm sure getting very close to to being quite um to those kind of cash flow thresholds which which may mean they need to, sh to shut permanently and quite where that tipping point is for lots of businesses um you know people won't necessarily know um so i think there will be cautious uh, spend um in some senses um i guess the other place where a lot of the spending might go and i think we've seen that definitely in some places is is on um the housing market um so places like actually edinburgh has been uh, quite a bit of a hot spot recently um for house purchases and then people looking for um, moving out of sort of big cities more um, for more space more greenery maybe second homes and places like that so I think that there's, there's quite a lot of spending that might end up um, going into that part of the economy which isn't necessarily um, always a great thing in terms of um, you know it's not the most productive place for money to go in the economy and it, it also puts a lot of pressures on people um, trying to buy homes for the first time so so it could go but if people have got a bit, you know, save a lot of money saved up, then that quite naturally will feel for some people is that's the best place to put it. Um, so, yeah, so I think 
it, yeah, it's there's definitely going to be um, probably a bit of a catch up, but this whole talk of um, will this be the roaring 20s? Um, I, I'm not too sure um, people are going to be um, that uh, enthusiastic and optimistic about about things just yet, uh, but um, we'll wait and see. Yeah, um, yeah, I suppose there, there is optimism around in terms of growth in particular sectors, but it is from a low base, so we do have to remember that, and things are still very uncertain, as you say. Um, it just linked to this, um, you know, as, as seeming to move into the recovery, um, or at least being able to, to use that word with confidence, uh, David, um, there, there's been some concern um, from some uh, around um, the inflationary pressures that are presenting in the economy. Um, and the Bank of England have obviously said more about that today. Um, but how much of a concern do you think that is just now um, in, in terms of, um, you know, the, the recovery? Um, well, inflation is definitely uh, picking up. Um, uh, at the start of the year, it was kind of uh, barely half a percent year on year. And by, by May, it was over 2%. And today, Bank of England... It's come out saying it thinks it will get to 3% later in the year. Some are actually forecasting it will, it will pick up more than that. I think the key question is, is this going to be, um, uh, to what extent is this a sort of temporary spike or to what extent is it uh, the sign of, 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 of something more permanent, a more permanent uh, substantial pickup in inflation? Um, and I think there's a good argument for saying that this is uh, probably a fairly transitory thing, and that's certainly what the Bank of England seems to think at the moment, or what the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England seems to think as well. So what's going on is, is that there's a spike in inflation, partly because commodity prices have, uh, have picked up again, which is really the flip side of them falling a lot at the start of the pandemic. Um, and there's also been a sort of recent surge in consumer spending um, as the as the tightest sort of set of restrictions were uh, initially lifted, um, but there's there's reason to believe that you know both of those things will be fairly short lived, and we've also got to keep an eye on the fact that we are proposing to wind back the furlough scheme, and unlike the US, we don't have a very generous uh, fiscal uh, po stimulus policy in place. So all of that probably means that uh, this pickup in inflation is, is going to be uh, fairly transitory, and therefore the Bank of England is, is going to try to look through that uh, and 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 not get carried away and start uh, uh, raising rates, it, it, because that would clearly risk um, uh, sort of slowing the recovery or thwarting the recovery just as it just as it gets going. So, uh, the Bank of England is clearly going to keep an eye on that, and things might change, particularly if the UK government uh, starts doing things very differently on on fiscal policy. But for now, uh, it, it looks like um, sort of no change on interest rates for the foreseeable future. That said, of course, um, even if inflation does does have a spike this year, even if that's transitory, that will have an impact on um, household spending power. Um, and, and, and that in turn will have distributional consequences because that will affect um, lower income households more than it does higher income households, um, you know, mainly because lower income households, as Emma was saying, spend a, a, a disproportionate amount of their income, uh, unlike how higher income households. So there are, there are some concerns around a, a pickup in inflation, even if it's transitory. Um, but, but but certainly at the moment, I don't think it's a it's a major macro economic um, concern, um, basically because there's still a lot of spare capacity in the in the economy. Yeah, and and um, sorry to come back to you, David, but there's a question that's totally in your area. Um, you know, um, you you mentioned fiscal policy. Um, uh, and obviously there's been a huge amount of money spent to support the economy to, to get it through to recovery and, and will continue to be spent in the next um, few years um, above what, what was expected in the past. Um, so what sort of budgetary issues or challenges do you think need to be thought about to, to secure recovery? Um, uh, well, there's lots of issues there. I mean, we've, we've, talked, we've talked a lot about economic recovery, of course, but there are, you know, 
other sorts of recoveries that people talk about. Well, we touched on the the sort of education recovery and catch up. Um, there's also a health health recovery, um, and you know it's pretty clear that it, you know in terms of in in terms of health in particular, I think the challenges um, around what's really required for a genuine catch up. It, uh, you know, haven't really been grappled with at a UK level or um, at a Scottish level. I mean, the, um, the there are some really pretty serious issues uh, brewing. I think if you if you look at what's going on in the health sector, as referrals from GPs and so on pick up, um, and some of the some of the uh, effects of uh, lower activity during the during the pandemic begin to reveal themselves. Um, so I do think, you know, at a UK level, there are some really big challenges. You kind of feel that the UK government is going to have to get a better handle on this and is going to have to think more about what it allocates to health and to education. Um, and I'm sympathetic to a view that says it's pretty difficult for the Scottish government to do some of this long term strategic planning, financial planning, when that isn't in place at the UK level because what's happening at a UK level does have a very direct impact on the Scottish budget. But having said that, I mean it does it does crystallise some of the challenges that need to be um, thought about and some of the things that I think we need to get better about scrutinising and get better evidence on. Um, I mean to, to give one example of this. Um, the, the Scottish government um, has announced that the non-domestic rates reliefs, the business reliefs for businesses in the tourism and hospitality sector are going to remain in place throughout the whole of this financial year. Now, on one level, you can see a very good rationale for that. We've talked in this session a lot about the challenges facing that sector. But clearly a policy like that is phenomenally expensive. Um, I mean, around 600 million, in fact, more than 600 million to, uh, to, to fund that relief through for a whole year. Um, and you can well imagine that whilst some businesses in that sector are gonna find that very valuable, um, clearly uh, there's a lot that aren't necessarily going to need it. And, and in fact, it's, it's, it's a policy that might not necessarily make the difference between survival and not survival for it might not make that that difference for a huge number of businesses. So thinking about the efficiency with which we get the outcomes that we need is is um, is really really important. Um, and uh, that's just one example of that. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, David. Lots of challenges there, definitely. Um, uh, Shane's asked a, um, it's probably the last question we've got time for, I'm afraid, but um, Shane's asked a question about whether our optimistic predict, predict, predictions for growth assume, um, essentially, um, I'm, I'm summarising Shane, I hope that's okay, um, essentially assume um, what the uh, sort of multiplier impact might be on town and city centres. So if, as um, some of our data suggests, a significant proportion of businesses are looking to reduce their office footprint. That will obviously have a, a knock-on effect to, to town and city centres potentially through through less commuting into them um, and all of these other issues. So um, and maybe in the longer term, there, there could be an impact or a lesser multiplier impact of that um, in, in, the, in the longer term. Um, and... Um, I guess what I would say is um, this is all very uncertain and of course um, we can more easily look ahead to the next year or so um, which is hard enough <laughs> than look ahead to what these structural changes in the labour market and the way that we use our town and city centres might mean for the future um, of the economy. How much of the spending that um, commuters might have done in town and city centres is simply displaced to other things. Okay, so traditional retail or retail within city centres might suffer, but, but money might be spent in other parts of the economy um, to compensate. So there will be certain sectors or certain parts of the country who may suffer, um, particularly in, maybe in, in, in smaller town centres and so on, um, but it may be that that's displaced elsewhere. But I don't know if from a kind of commercial um, property or, or um, a business point of view, Angela, you have any thoughts on, on sort of future of town and city centres and the impact of, of changing use of office space? So I'd probably just echo what you said there, Mary, and that, um, you know, a lot of firms, if not all, are looking at reductions 
in in the state um, and either re, you know reconfiguring or or getting out of leases where they don't have long term commitments. But certainly in all cases, they're looking to to reconfigure the footprint so that it's, it's focused on collaboration spaces. I've had conversations with chief execs in, in just about all the major cities around the UK over the last um, three months, and all of them are grappling with the problem of how to reinvent their city. So focus much more on entertainment and, and other reasons to come into the city centre other than retail or office working, which we're just, we're just I think we've already covered in this session, never going to get back to those, those things. So no one has worked out yet. Um, we don't we don't have a magic answer, I'm afraid, but we are we are helping to, to try and get there. But yeah, it, that is going to be something that's a major a major issue for us over over the coming years. Yeah, so so we didn't quite answer your question, Shane, but it is it is 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 a tricky one to know um exactly what the impact's going to be in the long term on the economy and where that spending might be displaced to. So it is yeah, it's a really tricky one, but um one to watch in terms of how things evolve as the year goes on and people return to more normal ways or the new normal ways of working. So um I'd just like to thank uh, my colleagues Emma and David and a um, special thanks to Angela for joining us today. It's been a really interesting discussion and um, thanks to all the attendees for coming along and, and asking all your really interesting questions. Um, uh, all of our uh, materials are available on fraserofallander.org um, and we'll be um, dripping out some more parts of the commentary and our, our perspectives over the next week for you to have a second chance to read them. But thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you for our next uh, interactive Q&A session. Cheers. Bye.